Greetings to all lovers of tales, myths, and legends. The world of the dead, the realm of shadows, is the place where what remains of us humans finds its final refuge. Here, there are its own rules and laws, and such a place must inevitably be ruled by a villain. In Greek mythology, the kingdom of the dead is ruled by Hades, but is he a villain or just a hostage of the situation? Deep in the bowels of the earth is the entrance to the realm of Hades. Here, among lifeless stones, the river Styx flows with its dark waters, surrounded by the shadows of those who once lived. This river flows through the heart of the kingdom of the dead, where the foul-smelling swamps are located. The shadows standing on the shore await for Sharon, the ferryman of souls, to arrive in his old boat. The grim, gray-bearded old man with wild eyes dressed in a cloak slowly glides among the whispering and moaning shades. He has nowhere to hurry. With a sharp gaze, he selects from the crowd those who are able to pay. During the funeral rite, the relatives of the deceased lift a coin under their tongue. He only transports those whose bones have been laid to rest in a grave. Sharon will never take anyone back under any circumstances. Those who cannot pay are doomed to eternal wandering without finding rest. Sharon sets the shadows in the boat and checks if everyone is paid. After that, he orders to row and steers the boat himself. Thus, the shades of the dead begin their last journey. But let's leave them for a while and talk about the owner of these places, Hades. As soon as the poor fellow was born, he was immediately swallowed by his father, Cronus, the same fate befell Hades' brothers and sisters, except for Zeus, who later freed them. Then Zeus and his brothers overthrew the Titans and Cronus. This period is called the Titanmachy. Now they had to figure out how to live on. Hades was the eldest son, and according to ancient laws, he should have inherited the most. However, Zeus had other plans. In the end, it was decided to draw lots. Poseidon got to see... Zeus got the sky, and he became the supreme god. Hades got the worst lot, the land of the dead. But did he want it? Of course not. Moreover, Hades was hurt because he was supposed to get everything, but he only got the realm of the dead. Now Hades sits on a golden throne in a dark hall. Around him the Furies, the goddesses of vengeance, torment, and suffering, hiss with malice, they are Alecto, Magera, and Tisiphon, grotesque old women with hair entwined with snakes. In addition, standing beside him are the relentless judges, Rhodamenthus and Minos, who preside over the final judgment of the shades. No transgression can escape their gaze. Behind Hades' throne stands the god of death, Thantos, whose sword severs the threads of people's lives, regardless of whether they were wise or foolish. Thanatos comes to the sick and dying and cuts a lock of their hair, thereby taking their souls. Also at the court of Hades is Hakat, the goddess of darkness, nightmares, and witchcraft. She wanders with her dreadful retinue among the graves, and she brings out the souls of the dead while sending nightmares to the living. Such is the entourage of the lord of the dead. Now let's return to the shades who drift in the rickety boat of Sharon, they have already reached the Sigean swamps and are now slowly making their way through the fog towards their destination, the gates of Hades. Chilling sounds surround them, weeping, groaning, and the clanking of chains. Among the lifeless plains in the mist and darkness, aimless shadows wander, unable to pay Sharon. And now ahead the dark gates are visible. Sharon disembarks everyone and leaves them on the shore. Suddenly, a fearsome creature emerges from the gloom, a dog with three heads. Its red eyes burn with an evil fire. Instead of a tail, a hissing snake, its fur bristling entwined with live snakes. This is the guard of the gates of Hades, the terrible Cerebrus. The chilling howl deafens the surroundings and paralyzes the shades. However, he does not harm those who have come to Hades. On the contrary... He greets and fawns over them. But those who try to leave Hades are mercilessly devoured. After the shades pass through the gates of Hades, they face their final judgment. While Radamanthus and Minos judge them, let's return to Hades. Hades is a god who lives in luxury. 
surrounded by wealth, precious stones, and metals, but only in the underworld. On the surface, he has nothing, and no one prays to him or builds temples in his honor. Moreover, his name is not mentioned. Instead, he is referred to by numerous epithets, such as rich, generous, and hospitable, including Pluto, which replaced his name in the late 5th century BC and absorbed the image of another separate deity, Plutus. However, it is worth mentioning that rituals dedicated to Hades were still performed, but only at night, and black animals were sacrificed to him. Always an even number and always upside down, Hades is detached from the rest of the world of gods and even immortals view death with contempt and disgust. Therefore, Hades rules his dark kingdom alone, indifferent to what happens above. However, sometimes he emerges on the surface. In one of these outings, he meets an incredibly beautiful girl who is gathering flowers in a meadow. Her name is Persephone, and Hades looks at her as if enchanted. He doesn't yet know that she is not an ordinary girl, but the daughter of his brother Zeus and the goddess Demeter. Deep under the ground, the fate of the shadows that we have been watching with interest has already been decided and now they stand at the crossroads of three paths. One of them leads to the Asphodel Meadows, where the souls of neither good nor evil people go. The second road is for those souls who committed crimes against the gods and people, and it leads to Tartarus, a deep abyss beneath the kingdom of Hades. Here, the titans and giants who are unfavorable to Zeus are also located. They all undergo terrible tortures and are doomed to eternal suffering. The third leads to Elysium, to the Elysian fields, where eternal spring reigns. Trees are full of fruit, and there is no need to make any effort to feed oneself. There is no grief for old age here. In essence, it is a kind of paradise. Thus the shades complete their final journey, dispersing along the three roads they have earned. And on the surface, the god whose heart seemed to have hardened during his reign over the kingdom of the dead falls in love with Persephone, who was also called Kor. He could have simply taken her and kidnapped her, but upon learning that she was his brother's daughter, he decides that such an act is not appropriate and goes to Zeus on Mount Olympus. There he asks for permission to marry Persephone. Zeus understands that he is caught between two fires, because if he refuses his brother, he will offend him. But on the other hand, if he gives him Persephone, Demeter, who loved her daughter very much, will never forgive him. As a true ruler, he gives an evasive answer, which does not mean yes or no. Hades understands this in his own way. He makes an agreement with Gaia, and a flower of wondrous beauty grows on the meadow where Persephone walks. It catches her attention, and as she bends down to pick it, Hades, wearing his helmet that makes him invisible, appears. As soon as the girl picks the flower, the earth beneath her feet opens up and a golden chariot appears from which Hades grabs Persephone and takes her with him into the depths of the earth. Hearing her beloved daughter's cry, Demeter rushed to the Nisian Valley, the same place where Persephone had been walking, but she could not find her there or in many other places. Overwhelmed with grief, Demeter put on black clothes and wandered the earth for nine days, walking through all the forests, valleys, and mountains, asking everyone she met if they had seen her daughter. Finally, she asked the same question of Helios, who told Demeter what had happened. The goddess of fertility was furious and demanded that Hades immediately return her daughter. But of course, he refused her. Demeter tried to resolve the matter through Zeus, but he was unable to do anything. So she left Olympus and, in the guise of a mortal, wandered the earth crying and moaning. The whole of nature mourned with her, the harvest perished, the flowers withered, and people starved. Not a single green twig remained on the trees, and life itself seemed to have stopped. Finally, Demeter arrived at the city of Eleusis, where she saw the crying woman, the daughter of King Silius, and took pity on her. However, the goddess did not reveal her true identity to them. She called herself Dio and said that she had lived in Crete before being kidnapped into slavery. She had since run away and was now wandering the world. 
Without revealing herself, Demeter stayed with Celius, becoming a nursemaid to his son, Demophon. Meanwhile, the gods on Mount Olympus were in turmoil. They did not know what to do as famine was becoming increasingly devastating. Zeus sent Iris to find Demeter and persuade her to return to Olympus, but she refused to listen. Many gods came to her with countless gifts, but the goddess of fertility remained adamant. She demanded only one thing, that Hades return Persephone to her. Finally, Zeus could no longer bear it and sent Hermes to convince Hades to return Persephone. After all, if this was not done, all people on earth would perish and there would be no one left to worship the gods. Eventually, Hades agreed to return Demeter's daughter, but he set a condition that the laws of the gods must be obeyed. After all, he had not broken them and had asked Zeus for permission to take Persephone. In the underworld, there is a law that no one can bypass. Those who have tasted the food of the dead can never return to the surface. Hermes asked Persephone if she had eaten anything in the underworld, and she insisted that she had not eaten a single morsel since Hades had taken her. The lord of the underworld had no choice but to release his beloved back to her mother. But as Hermes was leading Persephone away, as Caliphus, the gardener of the underworld, appeared, he claimed that Persephone had lied and that he had seen her pick a pomegranate and eat a few seeds. This meant that she had to stay in the underworld. Later, Demeter punished Escalaphus by imprisoning him in a pit and covering it with a rock. Hercules eventually freed him, but Demeter turned him into an owl. However, that is another story altogether. Right now, Demeter is furious and ready to destroy humanity. Then Zeus turns to his mother, Rhea, to persuade Demeter to calm down. Negotiations begin, leading to Persephone spending one-third of the year in the underworld and two-thirds above with her mother, Demeter. This is why, when mother and daughter are separated, the earth freezes and winter comes. Demeter mourns for her child and leaves Olympus while nature awaits her return. Thus, Persephone becomes the queen of the underworld, and despite everything, she eventually falls in love with Hades because he is not who he seems to be at first glance. It's not him who torments his subjects. It's the Arrhenius. He is not the embodiment of death. It's Thantos. Hades is forced to rule the underworld because that's the role he was given. Yes, Hades is cruel and doesn't tolerate being deceived. An example of this is Sisyphus, the king of Corinth who managed to capture the god of death himself, Thanatos. As a result, people on earth stopped dying. Naturally, the gods were furious. After a few years, Ares frees Thanatos, who takes Sisyphus' soul with him to the underworld. But even then, the king of Corinth manages to deceive the gods. He forbids his wife to perform the proper rituals to keep him in the underworld and turns the soft-hearted Persephone, asking to return to the surface to punish his disobedient wife. The queen of the underworld, taking pity on Sisyphus, agrees to release him temporarily. But the crafty Sisyphus has no intention of returning. He revels in his palace, boasting that he, the only mortal, managed to return to the world of the living. However, Hades, upon learning of this, finds a way to retrieve the escapee and punishes him by condemning him to Teateras, where Sisyphus is forced to roll a heavy boulder up a hill day after day, only to watch it roll back down again in the evening. Another myth tells of how Prithias, in return for Theseus' help in abducting Helen, asked him to assist in abducting Hades' wife, Persephone, so that he could marry her himself. The heroes descended into the underworld and demanded that Hades give up Persephone. Hades showed no anger, but instead offered the heroes a seat on his throne at the entrance of the underworld. Once they sat on the throne, they were immediately stuck to it. Theseus managed to free himself when Hercules descended into the underworld. However, Pirithus remained in the underworld forever, punished for his wicked desires. It is also worth remembering Asclepius, a physician who learned how to resurrect the dead, thereby taking away Hades' subjects. The lord of the underworld could not tolerate such competition and had Zeus strike Asclepius with a lightning bolt. But there is a myth that shows Hades from a different perspective. 
one of compassion. This is the myth of Orpheus and Eurydice. Orpheus was a great singer when he took up his lyre and sang. Everything around him stood still, even storms. The gods themselves listened to him with delight. Orpheus loved his young wife Eurydice more than anything else in the world, and she loved him in return. There was no happier couple on earth. But one day, while walking among the meadows, Eurydice met Aristeus, the son of Apollo. He desired her, but she resisted and fled. Unaware of a snake in the grass, she stepped on it and died from the bite. Heartbroken, Orpheus decided to go to the underworld and persuade Hades and Persephone to bring his beloved back to life. With the help of his lyre, he convinced Chiron to ferry him across the river Styx. When he approached Hades' throne, he sang a song about his love for Eurydice and their happiness on earth. He sang of his grief and sorrow at her loss. The song of Orpheus touched the hearts of the king and queen of the dead, and they agreed to return Eurydice to Orpheus, but on one condition. Orpheus had to leave, and Eurydice would follow him, but he must not turn around until they had left the underworld. If he looked back, he would lose Eurydice forever. Orpheus agreed, and without looking back, walked towards the exit. But at the very end of the path, he couldn't resist the temptation and turned around, thus losing his beloved forever. Such is the god Hades. After hearing all of this, everyone will draw their own conclusions and decide whether the Lord of the Underworld is a villain or a hostage to the situation. You can leave your opinion on this matter in the comments. Until we meet again.